uh, esteemed speaker for the day today. Uh, Maria, over to you. Thank you, Sergey. Dear audience, it is a great pleasure and honor to moderate this webinar organized by the World Federation of Pediatric Imaging on pediatric liver ultrasound, what do I need to look for? And introduce today's speaker, Professor Stephanie Franchiabella. Professor Stephanie Franchiabella received her medical degree from the University of Paris Saint Clay in France, where she completed her residency in radiology. She joined the pediatric radiology department at Bicetre Hospital, which is public and university hospital in Paris and Paris Saint Clay in University in 2001. Professor Franchi Abella is the head of the Pediatric Interventional Radiology Department and works in close cooperation with hepatologists and surgeons. Her two major clinical activities are pediatric and fetal abdominal diagnostic imaging and interventional radiology, while her research activities focus on pediatric liver transplantation, congenital hepatic vascular malformations, and development of imaging biomarkers for liver disease, such as liver and spleen elastography for fibrosis and portal hypertension, quantitative microdoppler quantification of fat using ultrasound and MRI. Moreover, for us that have had the opportunity to meet Professor Abella, she's a kind and modest pediatric radiologist for whom the European Society of Pediatric Radiology is profoundly proud of. During the lecture, you can submit questions or comments in writing through the Q&A box. Please state your country of origin when submitting questions, and we will try to answer as many as possible. The webinar will be rebroadcasted on the YouTube Live in our Pediatric Radiology Academy channel on March 27th, 2 a.m. EST, and all lectures will be uploaded on April 20th on YouTube Live. Dear Stephanie, the floor, or should I say the International Electronic Platform, is yours for your lecture. Stephanie. Thank you very much, uh, Maria, for this very kind uh, introduction. And I would like to really thank the World Federation of Pediatric Imaging and especially, especially uh, Sanjan and Joanna for uh, giving me the opportunity to give this lecture on uh, liver ultrasound and share my experience with you. Uh, this is a very broad subject of no disclosure. And as you know, the subject is very vast and I've only 45 minutes. So you will see that I have selected uh, only um, a few uh, s topics in each subcategories in order to underline the most relevant and useful uh, things for your daily practice. So we will start with technical considerations and neonatal specificities. Uh, then we will go through the pathology, biliary disorders, then chronic liver disease, uh, portal hypertension, tumor and liver masses, uh, and vascular malformations to finish. And you have this uh, little drawing, uh, don't fall into the tribe that I will put on some of the play of the slides just to underline some traps that you may avoid uh, uh, by using some uh, tips I will give you. So let's start with the technical considerations and neonatal specificities. As you know, it's very important to have a good quality exam to be able to make the diagnosis. When you do biliohepatic ultrasonography, usually we ask the patient to be fasting for at least four hours to have a nice uh, uh, analysis of the gallbladder and the bile ducts. You have to use several transducers to have an overview of the liver and then uh, include a study with high frequency probes that allows to see very clearly the margins of the liver and the parenchyma, the echogenicity of the parenchyma. In neonates, the high frequency probes may be the only one you need because it allows to see the whole liver uh, with a single probe. Of course, I will mainly focus on BMOD and Doppler study uh, that are the cornerstone of uh, a Doppler of, of uh, hepatic ultrasound. You need to use a standardized approach to be reproducible and to be able to compare one exam with the next one. Be systematic in your study. You have to choose an order to perform your exam and keep it. This will avoid to miss some uh, things, especially when you have a big abnormality. Sometimes you will focus on it and you will uh, forget to look at the other things. And the best thing is to have a standardized report that is adapted to the clinical question. 
here is the checklist when uh, you do the ultrasound of the liver and uh, for liver disorders it's a very classical uh, you look at the liver check if it's in the right position if the shape is normal the size the, the cogenicity the margins are they smooth irregular are the vessels in the right position with the right size are they patent uh, you will check for the biliary tract do you see them is the caliber normal how is their walls? Do you see the walls? Uh, how is the content? Uh, it's the same for the gallbladder, the spleen. And you have to check the kidneys, the pancreas, to see if there is uh, some abnormalities. And you will check for ascites, of course. You may use the side chart, especially for the spleen and the kidney, but also for the liver. Personally, I don't do it. I mostly uh, compare the size of the right liver with the right kidney to know if there is or not hepatomegaly. Here are the basic uh, images I like to provide when I give the report of a liver study, even if it's normal. You have to get uh, the left lobe of the liver on the sagittal view in front of the aorta, left lobe in front of the IVC. Then you go a little bit on the right and you turn the probe and it gives you the main portal vein. Uh, going right again, you have the right liver and the right kidney. This allows you to compare the echogenicity of the liver with the renal cortex to know if there, it is uh, normal echogenicity or abnormal and to see the size of the liver. Then with a subcostal way, uh, recurrent, you will have the hepatic veins, more caudally the portal verification, and of course, you will also see the gallbladder. For Doppler analysis, I won't go th in detail through the usual uh, triphasic spectrum of the hepatic vein, uh, the visceral spectrum of the hepatic artery. You have to know that if you want a good study of the main portal vein and the right portal vein, you should get an oblique view to have a very low angle between uh, the vessel and uh, the probe. But if you want to study the anatomy of the main portal vein, then you should use an anterior view to be perpendicular to the main portal vein. And this is also a good way to get uh, the left portal vein and its uh, arteries. And in the liver, one specificity is that the portal vein and the hepatic vein have the same direction. This means that when they are not the same color, you have to check and there is a problem or there is something to find. Of course, to report a focal lesion and even to screen properly the wool parenchyma, you will rely on the queen of segmentation with the, the veins that will uh, help you to recognize the different segments. So let's move now on to some pathology and physiological aspects in the neonatal liver. As you know, the hepatic hemodynamics is different from uh, fetal life, neonatal life, and uh, after. In the fetus, the umbilical vein drains into the left portal vein, and then you have the ductus venosus that will join the left portal vein and the IVC and allows about 30% of the umbilical blood to get directly to the heart. In the few days after birth, uh, this ductus venosus will remain patent and up to one month in premature babies. After this time, it will be closed and there will be no further macroscopic communication between the two systems. So what, here is the aspect of a normal ductus venosus in a premature baby. You can see here this very straight uh, vessel with hepatophugal flow. And you can see that there, there is an impairment of the portal flow in the left branch, but this is just due to the flow void and there is no thrombosis because we are frequently asked for thrombosis in those patients. And progressively, you will see the thickening of the ductus venosus. Here is a little classification, even in this case, and then the definite closure of the vessel. As you know, the ductus venosus is used when you place an umbilical vein catheter because it's the way the catheter will reach to the, to, to the heart. However, in some intenses, it may be in the wrong place, and this is a predisposing factor to have thrombosis of the portal vein. Most of the case, in most of the cases, it will be a left portal branch thrombosis because the catheter is in the left portal branch. And what matters in those 
cases is the patency of the main portal vein and the right portal branch. Because if the thrombosis extends to the main portal vein and the right portal branch, then there is a risk of portal hypertension, as you can see on this example. So uh, if uh, in those cases, we can discuss anticoagulation according to the condition of the patient. When it is only in the left portal branch, usually we don't do anything and it resolves spontaneously, or there is a thrombosis of the left portal branch, but we know with no risk of portal hypertension. The other thing that may happen during this neonatal period with umbilical vein catheter again with a malposition, is the infusion of uh, the liquid into the liver. And you can see here the UBC tract that tells you that this is not, this baby was referred for hepatoblastoma, but it was not hepatoblastoma. It was just a complication of the UBC uh, malposition. And you can see that in a few days it resolves. So let's move now on to uh, pathology and we will start with the biliary disorders. Biliary disorders, the revelation can be uh, a various context, pain, abdominal liver test, abnormal liver test, cholestasis, fortuitous diagnosis, especially in the prenatal diagnosis. And we will see that there is a real difference between the neonatal pathology versus older infants and children. So let's start with neonatal cholestasis. The real question with neonatal cholesterol stasis for radiologists is the baby with acolytic stools, because the question in that case is, is it biliary atresia? And we know that if we do the early diagnosis of biliary atresia, then the surgeon can do the surgery early, and this improves the, the prognosis of the patients. That's why we have to be very cautious about this uh, context. So the neonatal cholestasis are for half because of medical causes and half are secondary to surgical causes. And biliary atresia is about 40% of the surgical causes. In uh, those surgical causes, as usually, you know, there is a, a, a biliary obstruction and there will be a balduct dilatation as expected. But in biliary atresia, which is a surgical cause, the pitfall is that it is, uh, there will be no balduct dilatation like you can see in the medical causes. So this is really a trap you, may, you, you have to avoid. So let's see first the neonatal cholestasis with balduct dilatation. So this is easy. It's obstruction with balduct dilatation. You may have like in this case, it's a one month old baby with alcoholic stools di uh, dilated intrahepatic and extrahepatic balducts with a lithiasis in the pancreatic head. Uh, so, this is very easy, it's biliary lithiasis in infants. However, the treatment is different from older children and adults if there is no fever and the alcoholic stools are there for less than two weeks or it's only partially alcoholic stools, then you have to wait. And in most of the time, you have the spontaneous resolution of the obstruction in about 80% of the cases. At the opposite, when uh, there is alcoholic stools for more than two weeks, when there are a sepsis uh, context, then we have to do something. So in my center, it's interventional radiology with uh, uh, cholecystography and saline flushing, but it may be also surgery. And it's not uh, a, uh, an easy surgery because uh, of the small size of the bowel duct. Another kind of obstruction is a prenatal diagnosis of a cyst in the liver helium in a baby who, have, who has halocolic stools at birth. You see here the di cystic dilatation of the extrahepatic bowel duct, but also the dilatation of the intrahepatic bowel duct. So this is a congenital biliary dilatation, what we used to call colloidal cyst. And uh, the main pitfall in this topic is to make the difference with that kind of presentation, exactly the same prenatal diagnostic, acolytic stools at birth, but that time you have the huge cyst, cyst in the liver helium, but no intrahepatic balder dilatation, and this is biliary atresia. So let's move out now on to the diagnosis of the other causes, medical causes, and biliary atresia. 
So biliary atresia is the fibrous obliteration of the intrahepatic and extrahepatic bile ducts. The extent of the fibrous obliteration of the extrahepatic bile duct is variable. And as I told you previously, we have to do the diagnosis as early as possible. The US patterns that are suggestive of biliary atresia are first the tri what we call the triangle coat sign. It's this hyperechoic area just at the beginning of the right portal branch that, that should be you no know, thicker than four millimeters, and it's the fibrotic remnant of the bile duct. The other thing you're going to look for are uh, abnormal patterns of the gallbladder that can, can have thickened and irregular walls, uh, can be small and can be absent. You may have cysts at the liver helium, like we saw in the previous slides. And you can have microcysts in the same area than the triangular cord sign. And of course, you will search also for signs of polysplenic syndrome. So those signs are very, very specific, but have a variable sensitivity. And what an important topic is that you will not have bile duct dilatation, never. When you look for signs of polysplenic malformatic syndrome, you will search for abnormal situs, uh, in situs inversus or situs ambiguous. You will look for polysplenia or asplenia, abnormal topography of the vessels, especially prejudinal and menporal vein, and uh, IVC aziguous continuation or other variants, intestinal malnutrition and congenital heart disease. When you report in neonatal cholestasis your ultrasonography, if the bile ducts are dilated, then you can rule out biliary atresia. If you have one specific ultrason or several signs, then biliary atresia is strongly suspected. But if the ultrason is normal, then biliary atresia is still possible. And if you work with a pediatric team that is not very trained uh, in this topic, then you have to write it in your conclusion. Say, okay, we cannot rule out biliary atresia even if this uh, ultrasound is absolutely normal. So let's move now on to biliary disorders in older infants and children. We will uh, see cholelithiasis, biliopancreatic maljunctions, and a few examples of tumors. So here is the easy, very classical case, sickle cell disease in a seven-year-old girl with acute abdominal pain. You see the bile duct dilatation and the, the lithiasis here in the extrahepatic back duct. So it's a cholelithiasis. She would be treated by surgery. Here is another case. It's five-year-old boy. He has acute abdominal pain, really pancreatitis. He had the same episode a few weeks ago with spontaneous resolution. As you can see, there is a huge dilatation of the intrahepatic and extrahepatic bile duct. You can also see here a plug at the end of the extrahepatic bile duct. And here you can clearly see the pancreatic duct joining uh, the bile duct very far from the papilla. So there is a, a, an abnormally long common bile duct. And this makes the diagnosis of congenital dilatation of the bile duct. When needed, you can confirm it, for example, using an MRCP that shows the same uh, things with very dilated, you see uh, bile duct here. And what is interesting in uh, this uh, case is that uh, though the symptoms resolve spontaneously in the following days, and you can see that on the US control, the dilatation of the biliary tract is very, very mild and even almost absent. So this is a real trap because if you see the patient out uh, when there is no obstruction, you will not suspect this pathology. So why is it important to take uh, this pathology into um, account? Because, uh, so the definition of the biliopancreatic maljunction is when the pancreatic duct joins the bile duct outside the duodenal wall. And this allows the pancreatic sac to go into the bile duct and uh, the, bile, uh, the bile to go in the pancreatic duct. The diagnosis is done by showing the abnormal 
uh, abnormally long common channel between the two ducts that is more than five millimeters in children on ERCP and MRCP. And you will have also most of the time elevated pancreatic enzymes in the bile. So this biliopancreatic maljunction is rarely isolated and most of the time you will have extrahepatic bile duct uh, dilatation that is associated the definition being five more than five millimeters in children. And when you have to the two uh, things associated, then you can make the diagnosis of congenital biliary dilatation, what we usually call colidocal cyst. So what is the problem with this is that there is consequences. The pediatric presentation is highly variable. You can have a prenatal diagnosis when there is a huge dilatation. You may have recurrent abdominal pain, vomiting, jaundice, abdominal mass, biological pancreatitis, cholestasis. Some people may present only with thickened gallbladder wall, and you may have, of, co of course, a congenital biliary dilatation. The risk is uh, the presence of uh, pancreatitis that may be very severe and the development of cancers, especially cholangiocarcinoma, mostly in young adults, but the youngest case is four-year-old. Usually we use MRCP to confirm the diagnosis or ERCP, or you may do cholecystography with those age of the pancreatic enzymes in the bile. The treatment is the surgery with the resection of the wool extrahepatic bile duct and the gallbladder and the bilioenteric anastomosis, especially because of the risk of cancer. So keep in mind this pathology. Here is a case of a nine-year-old girl with progressive jaundice and acolytic stools, and she was referred for a congenital biliary dilatation. So there was a very a uh, huge dilatation of the extrahepatic bile duct, the intrahepatic bile duct, but you can see here very clearly that it was uh, secondary to a, an extrinsic uh, compression of the bile duct due to a mass into the pancreatic head. So this was not a congenital biliary dilatation, but it was a cancer of uh, the pancreas, very exceptional one. But uh, as you can see on these images, the simple uh, um, analysis of uh, the ultrasound allows to make the diagnosis of extrinsic compression by a tumor. Here is another case. It was referred also for congenital biliary dilatation. Uh, and uh, you can see that he has intrahepatic bile duct dilatation, extrahepatic bile duct dilatation, but there is echogenic material in the bile duct and in uh, the cystic duct with a very thickened wall of the gallbladder that is large and sludge in the gallbladder. And this is a rhabdomyosarcoma that is the typical biliary tumor of uh, the children. Here is another case of rhabdomyosarcoma with bile duct dilatation, a mass in the liver, and once again, tumor inside the, the extrahepatic duct. Last but not least, probably the most frequent, and you all know this, the acute acalculus cholestasis uh, in acute viral hepatitis. And you will see those very impressive aspect of the gallbladder that has a thickened gall, uh, wall with pericholecystic fluid, may have sludge inside. It will be associated with hepatomegaly and adenomegalies, and you will do the diagnosis uh, with the biology. So the main messages for this part of biliary disorders is in neonates, uh, look for biliary atresia and the only way to rule out it is when you have a bile duct dilatation, otherwise you can't rule out biliary atresia. And the second point is a uh, thin biliopancreatic maljunction when, when you have patients with recurrent abdominal pain, dilated bile ducts, pancreatitis, abnormal liver tests, or whatever, and even if the bile ducts are not dilated. So let's move on to chronic liver disease and portal hypertension now. The circumstances for the diagnosis of chronic liver disease and portal hypertension are uh, of two kinds. On one hand, you may know the disease and then follow up and check for signs of chronic liver disease and signs of portal hypertension and signs of complications specific to the disease, tumor, biliary disorders. And on, this, on the other end, you may have a 
signs of chronic liver disease or portal hypertension when you do the ultrasound, and then you have to search for the cause. I will go very fast on the parenchymal modification in cirrhosis. They are the same than in adult patients, and you really have to use the high frequency probes to, to look at them and elastography when you have this. For the signs of portal hypertension, we have the same signs that in adults with a decrease of the portal venous hepatic input and increase in the arterial input and uh, identification of portal systemic uh, chance. There are some specific signs to the pediatric population. First, let's start with a lesser omentum that can be thickened in children. So this sign is good for uh, infant and uh, young children. And uh, you will compare the diameter of the aorta to uh, the distance between the anterior wall of the aorta and the posterior part of the liver. And if it is more than 1.5 aortic diameter, then it is a sign of portal hypertension, like you can see on this case or this case. And when you put the Doppler, sometimes you can see branches of the gastric vein that have an hepatofugal flow confirming the portal hypertension. So this is quite a sensitive uh, sign in a smaller children and infants. The second one is the patency of the ductus venosus. We already talked about the ductus venosus, but sometimes it remains patent even if thin and in the context of a, a portal hypertension, it's a good sign of portal hypertension that happened most of the time during the perinatal period. And you can see here the aspect in an 18-month-old uh, child with a biliary atresia. Of course, you have the semiology of hepatofugal to and fro flow in uh, intrahepatic portal veins and even splenic veins sometimes. The portal systemic collaterals you will look for, uh, in children you may be able to see very clearly the splenorenal shunts by using uh, the window, the acoustic window of the spleen and uh, the kidney on a lateral view. And let's see now what are the causes of chronic liver disease and portal hypertension in children. Uh, the suprahepatic block are very rare. There are more, less than 5% of the cases and you will find like in adults the venoocclusive disease, but usually you have a context, but carry syndrome and the cardiac causes. Let's see two examples. He, this boy was 18 months old and he had increased abdominal uh, volume uh, at diagnosis. You can see that there is an hepatomegaly with uh, large ascites. There is a clot here in the portal vein. We can't see the ostia of the hepatic veins. And there is a reverse flow in the main portal vein and the intrahepatic vein. So there are obvious signs of portal hypertension with obstruction of the hepatic veins. And the elastography shows very increased levels of liver and spleen stiffness. It should be less than seven for the liver and less than 20 uh, for the spleen. So this was a typical case of Bud Carey syndrome, but no, not that this is extremely rare in uh, pediatric patients, but you can make the diagnosis with the ultrasound. In this case, it was a teenager's refugee from Africa. He had recurrent abdominal pain with intermittent increased abdominal volume for 10 years. Uh, he was referred with, uh, from another center for the workup of chronic liver disease with a CT and an MRI. But when doing the ultrasound, we can see very clearly that the hepatic veins and the IVC was very, very large with a mild uh, splenomegaly, normal flow in the hepatic vein, a stiff liver, a stiff spleen, ascites, and it was so large that we thought strongly that it was a suprahepatic obstacle. And going back to the CT scan, we could see that it was a case of a chronic uh, pericarditis, constrictive pericarditis, and it was related to tuberculosis. It was treated with pericardectomy with great improvement on, on the liver condition. So now we're going to see the causes of uh, chronic liver disease and portal hypertension in the liver, the most important group, uh, it's in tripatic disorders. Uh, so you may have chronic hepatitis. We, we don't have much of them in France, but in some countries, it may be the first cause, biliary atresia, of course. Uh, and I would underline some um, 
uh, increasing uh, causes like uh, non ancoli fatty liver disease and NASH. And uh, I will also show you the typical aspect of congenital hepatic fibrosis as it can make the diagnosis with the ultrasound. So sometimes you see uh, children coming with chronic liver disease, they, are, uh, they have cholestasis, but you don't have the diagnosis that was not done during the neonatal period. If you see along the portal veins, those kinds of biliary cavities that can be of various size, various content, they can be uh, really uh, liquid or they can contain uh, echogenic things. This is very suggestive of the diagnosis of biliary atresia. Uh, I wanted to talk also about uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. You know, now that it's the first cause of chronic liver disease in adults, and it's becoming in adults the first cause of liver transplantation. And there is an increasing number of pediatric patients with an impact and it's becoming an important cause of chronic liver disease in children in some countries. It is mostly in overweight and obese children, and there are predisposing factors such as uh, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and uh, a familial history of uh, NAFLD. The problem with this is that the NAFLD may evolve to NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, that can go to cirrhosis and those patients may develop hepatocellular carcinoma. But you can also have HCC that develop on NASH without cirrhosis. So we have to make the diagnosis in these children and uh, for the detection and the screening, what is proposed now is to do liver ultrasound to see the typical aspect of steatosis with the hyperechoic liver when compared to uh, the kidney and liver enzymes. But the problem with this is that the liver test can be normal. The steatosis may be misdiagnosed on ultrasound because when uh, the steatosis is mild, uh, you may have a normal echogenicity and you will miss if you only screen obese children, the NAFLD in normal weighted children. When there is fibrosis, diagnosed on elastography or liver biopsy or because there is signs of cirrhosis, then you have to, to follow them very closely because of the risk of HCC. And liver biopsy remains now the gold standard for the diagnosis. Here is a, a case of five-year-old boy with a neonatal history of umbilical catheter and he was referred, he had um, uh, GI bleeding and he was referred for portal hypertension with the first diagnosis of portal cavernoma related to portal vein obstruction. However, when you look at the ultrasound, you can see the main portal vein and the intrahepatic vein that are patent, but with a cavernoma along this patent main portal vein, this is very unusual for a cavernoma related to obstruction. He has a heterogeneous parenchyma, so it's a sign of chronic liver disease, with a cyst in uh, the kidney. And you can see here very clearly on the CT scan, the coronal view, that there is a patent main portal vein and a cavernoma along this patent main portal vein. So this is not a classical cavernoma secondary to portal vein obstruction, but it's a uh, an aspect typical of congenital hepatic fibrosis, and you will do the diagnosis with your ultrasound exam. The congenital hepatic fibrosis is a notosomal uh, recessive disease with portal fibrosis, biliary dysplasia, polycystic kidney disease. And what you may see also on the ultrasound is hyperechoic nephromegaly, and you may see also biliary dilatation with the central dot sign. The clinical manifestation depends on the degree of hepatic and renal involvement, and you may have very severe portal hypertension in children with GI bleeding. You may have infection, cirrhosis, and so on, and sometimes they have renal failure, but really the ultrasound can help to make the diagnosis. We will finish this chapter with uh, the extrahepatic portal vein uh, that are portal vein obstruction in about one third of the cases. So I showed you the differential diagnosis with a congenital hepatic fibrosis. Another pitfall uh, is to uh, misdiagnose a large collateral vein like this one as the main portal vein. So this is not the main portal vein. In fact, this is a large um, biliary vein 
that uh, is that creates the cavernoma transformation to feed uh, the liver. And when you look at uh, the CT scan, you see there was no main portal vein. This is the hepatic artery, and this is the cavernoma going to the liver. So the main portal vein is very straight, and when it's not straight, it may be a cavernomatous uh, vein going to the liver. So let's move now uh, onto masses and tumors. Uh, the circumstances for the diagnosis is uh, an abdominal mass or any other symptoms. It can be a fortuitous discovery, can do the prenatal diagnosis. Or sometimes there is a predisposing factor and you are going to screen for the appearance of a liver nodule. To make the diagnosis, you will uh, trust. Uh, you you will check the age. Uh, that is very important. You will see if there are associated disorders, predisposing disease, for example, or cardiac failure or cutaneous hemangiomas that may be in favor of hemangiomas. Fever for infectious disease or precocious pu puberty, for example, in hepatoblastoma. The level of, of alpha fetoprotein is also very important because it will be elevated in hepatoblastoma and HCC. And of course, the aspect on imaging will help you to make the diagnosis. As I told you, the age is very important. So in the youngest, you will have the hemangioma, no later than one year old. You have to make the diagnosis during the first year of life. After, it could be angiosarcoma. In uh, the field of... Uh, Early benign lesion, you have the cystic mesenchymatous hematoma. We would see it later. Then you have the hepatocellular adenoma and the focal nodal hyperplasia you will find in the older children and teenagers. Concerning malignant lesion, the hepatoblastoma is the most frequent. It's 95% of uh, the tumors, the malignant tumors of the a child and it's uh, really during uh, late infancy and uh, childhood and early childhood. You will have HEC and indifferentiated embryonal sarcoma rather in all children and teenagers. But of course, all these lesions can be found at any age, except the hemangioma. If we look now at the aspect on imaging, when you have a solid lesion, it would be mostly hemangioma when it's less than one year old and hepatoblastoma when it's associated with elevated alpha fetoprotein. When the lesion is cystic or very necrotic, then the two diagnoses are cystic mesenchymal hematoma for the benign lesion in the youngest and undifferentiated embryonal sarcoma in older children and it's a malignant lesion. Of course, in the solid lesion, when you have uh, adenoma, focal nodular hyperplasia, or HEC, you have to search for predisposing conditions. So you will search for signs of chronic liver disease or vascular malformation. And of course, you will have to think about non-tumoral masses, regeneration nodules, focal steatosis, simple hepatitis, abscesses, infection, granular mass. So we're going to see some examples of these pathologies. So the most frequent uh, tumor of uh, the infantile uh, liver is this. It's a prenatal diagnosis. You can see the solid liver mass, heterogeneous, with calcification inside and hypervascularization on Doppler, high systolic speed of the hepatic artery and the dilation of uh, the draining hepatic vein. So this is typically a hepatic hemangioma. So it's the most frequent benign, benign liver tumor is in uh, infants, and it's a vascular neoplasm. It's not a malformation. There are three forms. It can be solitary, multiple, or diffuse. And always do the diagnosis before one year of age, because after it may be angiosarcoma. The clinical presentation is very variable. It can be prenatal diagnosis. It can be because the baby has hemangiomas on the skin or fortuitous. And sometimes it's revealed by complication, abdominal mass, high output cardiac failure or conceptive coagulopathy. The natural history is the spontaneous involution, but it may happen after a per period of growing. You can see on this slide that the aspect on the ultrasound is extremely various. It can be of any ecogenicity, homogeneous or heterogeneous, and it, the intensity of the vascularization is highly variable. 
once again, it's, it's the same thing when you look at the multifocal or the diffuse form. So you won't be able to make the diagnosis because it is hyper or hypoechoic. It can take any form. I show you here a contrast enhanced ultrasound. I, I know that not uh, everybody is, has it available in, uh, in all centers, but it's very interesting when you can do it because it shows you the typical aspect of enhancing with a strong peripheral early enhancement at the arterial phase and a pro progressive feeling uh, during uh, the rest of uh, the survey. And here you have uh, the aspect on multiple lesion. And this can be very helpful when you have a dupe adapt for the diagnosis to confirm your diagnosis very easily. The ultrasound is very important because it will show you the, the, the mass and mass make the diagnosis, but there are also prognostic factors, uh, especially to know if uh, the patient has a risk to develop symptoms. Uh, and this is the tumor volume. In our experience, it's more than 50 milliliters and there are more uh, patients with symptoms among, uh, above this um, cut off. Uh, the peak systolic speed of the hepatic artery when it's more than uh, 100, 110 centimeter per second, there are more symptomatic patients, the presence of protohepatic shunts, and if there is enlargement of the hepatic veins or the hepatic artery. In typical cases, you don't need other images, uh, imaging in most cases. If you have a doubt on the diagnosis or if there are severe complication that will need other treatment, then you can make contrast ultrasound, MR or CT to confirm the diagnosis and have the vascular map. The evolution is excellent in most cases. Most are asymptomatic and you just have to follow them up until resolution of the tumor. If they have symptoms, then it's usually a symptomatic treatment and you may use propanolol or steroids, but we don't know exactly for, for now that if it is efficient or no. And if there is a failure of the medical treatment, then we can do embolization of the hepatic artery or surger surgical ligation. Here is a boy who had a systematic follow-up for the uropathy and you can see that he has small nodules in the liver. And of course, it's not always a hemangioma. And you can see here that there is an adrenal mass. And this was, of course, uh, liver nodules with a retroperitoneal peritoneal mass. It's a neuroblastoma with liver metastasis. So always check carefully the whole abdomen to check if there is no a mass. In this two-year-old girl, uh, she had an abdominal mass, and you can see this huge liver mass associated with a thrombosis in the IVC. So there was only one diagnosis. It's an hepatoblastoma that will be confirmed with a very high level of alpha fetoprotein. Hepatoblastoma uh, is a tumor of the young child. Uh, the median age is 18 months old and mostly before the age of two years or three years. It is associated with prematurity and low birth weight, but also with all, all other syndromes. And the elevation, a very high level of alpha fetoprotein is present in more than 90% of the cases. We use uh, the, the imaging especially a CT and MR to do the pretext pretreatment uh, extension classification and they are treated most of the time by chemotherapy and surgery. In that case uh, of a teenager with abdominal pain for tritus uh, discovery of uh, liver mass but you can see that there is no ab no portal vein in the liver, but there is a large communication between the main portal vein and the IVC. So you make the diagnosis of hepatic tumors associated with a congenital portal caval shunt, portal systemic shunt. And this was hepatocellular adenoma biopsy. The interest to make the diagnosis is that uh, this will influence the management of the patient. And uh, we did close this communication. This allowed the restoration of the portal flow to the liver and the decrease during the, the follow-up and disappearance of uh, the adenoma. So it's extremely important when you find a tumor like this to check if there is a vascular disorders associated. 
this four-year-old girl was referred for right hydronephrosis, but you can see there's a huge uh, amount of fluid in this abdomen, but we were very surprised to see the close relationship uh, of this with uh, the right hepatic vein. So we were wondering if it was not an hepatic mass. This was confirmed on the CT scan, and you have the typical aspect of a multilocular cystic hepatic mass, in a young child with very thin regular septa, and this is typical of a cystic mesenchymal hamartoma. At the opposite, in this uh, older child, 10 year old, uh, she has lost weight, uh, she has abdominal pain, uh, normal alpha fetoprotein, and she has this very large uh, hepatic mass that is very, very necrotic. And this is very suggestive of the diagnosis of indifferentiated embryonal sarcoma. Those, those two are the type of tumors with fluid component, are they really cystic? So if it's really cystic in a young child, it's a cystic mesenchymal hamartoma. In older children and teenagers, if it's more necrotic with the regular septa, then it's undifferentiated embryonal sarcoma. You have to know that the, those two pathology may be associated and uh, it is a surgical resection for the treatment in both cases. Of course, you will find also a simple hepatic cyst. Uh, this was a di prenatal diagnosis. Those uh, cysts are frankly in segment four and they are simple congenital hepatic cysts. And the natural history in most of the cases is the spontaneous shrinkage of the cyst in uh, the months following birth. I won't talk a lot about it at its cyst. We don't have much in France, but I know that in some countries it's a real uh, daily problem. And you know that uh, ultrasound is the base for uh, the classification of those lesions to distinguish active lesions from transitional lesions and inactive lesions. We will finish with this seven-year-old boy with a persistent liver and abdominal pain. He had the diagnosis of uh, appendicitis that was not confirmed on surgery, shame on, on us, and, and we didn't see this aspect and he, he remained um, uh, with fever in the following days and a few days, five days later, you can see very clearly that the lesion becomes more heterogeneous and once again, when you use the high frequency probe, you can see very nicely, uh, more uh, adequately, uh, this very heterogeneous and uh, thickened fluid uh, content that was uh, a liver abscess and it was an abebic uh, abscess. So my message is for liver tumors and masses is think hemangioma. It's the most frequent before the age of one year, but never after one year. Hepatoblastoma is the most frequent malignant tumor and alpha fetoprotein is very elevated. When you have free content, think cystic mesenchymal hamartoma or undifferentiated embryonal sarcoma. You have to check for predisposing factor uh, for hepatocellular proliferation, both sleep, chronic liver disease and congenital portosystemic shunt and don't forget of course infection and the context will help you. We will finish with the vascular malformations. Uh, there are two different entities. Uh, there can be communication between veins like congenital portosystemic shunts or communication between arteries and veins and those are arteriovenous uh, fistulas that are very very rare. The normal aspect of the hepatic vessels on USB mode is as follow. And if one of the vessel is enlarged or absent, then you have to look for a vascular malformation. So I will start with the less and frequent, uh, the congenital portosystemic shunts that are communication between the portal system and the systemic veins. And they are uh, at the origin of a partial or complete diversion of the portal blood to the systemic veins. Uh, it, the frequency is not very well known. It's supposed to be one among 30,000 births, but in a recent uh, prenatal uh, paper, it was suspected in one for 6,000 fetuses, and this is quite frequent. It can be isolated or associated with other abnormalities, especially cardiac malformation or the polyspina syndrome. There are different anatomical types, portohepatic shunt with connection between 
portal and hepatic veins. Portal cavalchant with connection between the main portal vein and the IVC. Persistent ductus venosus, abnormally large that doesn't uh, close after birth. And uh, any communication between um, an afferent vein of the portal system and an afferent vein of uh, the IVC. So it can be uh, splenic vein, iliac vein, mesenteric vein, renal vein, those communicating one with the other. The most frequent thing you will see, and probably you have already seen, is portal hepatic shunts. They are communication between portal and hepatic veins. The second most frequent is the communication between the portal bifurcation and the IVC at a lower, so it is lower than the ductus venosus when you look on the sagittal view. And here is the malformative pattern ductus venosus. Here you have the main portal vein getting in the liver, the left portal branch and the ductus venosus that is very large and patterned going into the IVC. There are complications related to those malformations and uh, they, they can uh, bring uh, liver lesion and especially that can evolve to HEC. There can be pulmonary hypertension or arteriovenous pulmonary shunts. This can be uh, also portosystemic encephalopathy, and there are various uh, biological disorders related to those malformations. So this for the treatment, there is not still a consensus. However, in the larger center, we, we and in the papers now, it is shown that endovascular or surgical closure allows to prevent the complication. And they are, uh, those procedures are safe and with a low morbidity. So for uh, most of uh, the centers now, the large centers, there is a proposition of preventive closure in, in, uh, in those centers. Neonatal in extrahepatic forms uh, for very few patients and during the second year of life in others. Of course, when you have a patient who has complication, you will propose to close the malformation. Is closure always necessary? No. Uh, for the most frequent type I showed you, it's a porto hepatic shunt. We expect the spontaneous closure of those malformations in about 80% of the patient. And in our experience, it's around with a median age of three months old. So we, we keep an eye on those children, hoping that it will resolve spontaneously. We're going to move now on the last uh, chapter that are congenital arteriovenous fistula. So it's the communication between one of several branches of the hepatic artery and one of several portal or hepatic veins. It's extremely rare in hepatic veins. It's mostly portal veins. And this leads to an elevation of the blood pressure in the venous system. And mostly if it's a portal vein, a portal hypertension. The diagnosis is exceptional. It can be fortuitous, sometimes prenatal. It can be associated to a non pathology, uh, especially Brandiosla, or it can be a, um, there can be signs of portal hypertension, especially GI bleeding. The fistula can be unique or multiple and can happen in only a small part of the liver or the whole liver. Here is a case of a systematic screening in a Down syndrome. And as you can see, there was abnormal vessels along uh, the left portal branch. And we could see a reverse flow in uh, the left portal branch with a normal flow in uh, the artery, a normal flow in uh, the right portal branch, but a reverse and very arterialized uh, blood flow in the main portal vein. So this was a congenital arteriovenous fistula with portal hypertension. The management is when there is no signs of portal hypertension, we follow them up to find signs of portal hypertension. And as soon as they are symptomatic or with enlargement of the vascular dilatation, then we try to do endovascular vascular management when possible, or we can do surgery if uh, necessary. So the main message for vascular malformation, if, if a vessel has an abnormal size or root or flow, then check why, and you have to answer the question. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Stephanie. This was a beautiful guided tour to the wonderful uh, world of imaging of the pediatric liver. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, questions. Um, 
Are you ready to answer them? We have questions regarding focal liver lesions. Uh, yeah. If you have a uh, 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 new rule from Malaysia is asking, uh, how can you be sure about uh, multiple hemangiomas? How do we, you diagnose them uh, versus, for example, metastasis from uh, neuroblastoma, et cetera? So usually you, the, the aspect is not, uh, usually you won't find a, a, a mass in the abdomen, but anyway, we do uh, the biological tests. So we're going to have uh, the, all the biological tests to rule out formally neuroblastoma. But in most cases, it's, it's obvious. And mostly if it's associated with, uh, hepat uh, with uh, cutaneous hemangiomas, and uh, if you have, uh, for example, a heart, high cardiac outflow or even cardiac failure, this is really in favor of uh, hepatic hemangioma. And in those patients with multiple lesions in the liver or even with mm -hmm. a single hemangioma, you should uh, search for a hypothyroid that can be associated to. Okay. Uh, uh, you, a question from me. You mentioned that uh, if you have a va very vascular lesion below the age of one, then it's probably a, a vas uh, a, a, it's not a uh, angiosarcoma. Can you tell us uh, a little bit about the imaging features of angiosarcoma when to, uh, to suspect that this is an angiosarcoma and not a hemangioma? Yeah, so uh, the age is important. I mean, if you find a vascular lesion in a liver uh, after the age of one year, you have to be very cautious to rule out an angiosarcoma. So if it's a focal lesion, there can be some uh, typical aspect you don't find uh, all the time. It's a central uh, arterial enhancement and not a peripheral like an hemangioma. But you don't have this all the time. And, and the, the real problem is that if you do the biopsy, sometimes the biopsy can answer hemangioma. So as a principle, when we find such a tumor in a two-year, three-year, four-year-old uh, uh, kid, uh, we consider it uh, as an angiosarcoma, uh, even if the biopsy say no. And the other uh, category of patient are patients who have multiple hemangiomas in the liver that are known in a very uh, early period, but uh, those uh, can decrease and then they increase in size again. And if it increases around the age of one year, then it can be a, a transformation of hemangioma to angiosarcoma. So those are extremely rare. But when you can find this, uh, you have to be very, very uh, cautious because uh, it's a very severe disease. And if you don't make a liver transplantation or a clear resection, a resection uh, there is no treatment uh, and the, the kid will die. Thank you. Uh, we have more questions. We have a, a question from uh, Go from uh, Hungary. Uh, would you control all babies with umbilical catheters for portal vein thrombosis? If yes, when, before or after removal of the catheter, of the umbilical venous catheter? So if, if uh, the catheter is in the right place, I mean, oh. if it goes in uh, the right atrium, uh, okay, the risk of thrombosis is very low. And if you don't keep it more than two or three days, so... For all those patients, we don't do any systematic control. If there is a malposition of the catheter, then we may, we may do the control. And as soon as possible, because it's very important to see if there is or not an extension to the right portal branch or, or the main portal vein. And be, uh, after removal. Okay. Thank you. Regarding the, uh, the, the venoocclusive disease, uh, uh, okay, uh, there is, I'm trying to sort of group the, the, question. uh, the questions here. Um, do you uh, recommend MRI for an hepatic mass? Uh, 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 
complementary to ultrasonography if uh, there are no specific finds for for uh, from your ultrasound exam this is uh, a this uh, from turkey asking uh, and yeah. um, my complementary question on this is do you use hepato specific uh, contrast uh, agents when you do a, a hepatic mri so so uh, of do course do you recommend uh, mri yeah of course I, so and i focused on on this short time, I focused on the ultrasound, but of course, uh, MRI is necessary, except if you have uh, for sure a benign, if you have an hemangioma for sure, or hepatic cyst for sure, and you should do, of course, uh, the MRI. And in France, uh, we have a specific um, products, but not, not the best one. So we, I don't use it in uh, in. Uh, daily practice, I, I, I use it when I want to make the difference between adenoma and focal nodular hy hyperplasia. But okay. of course, it can be interesting Question. to use it. Thank you. Regarding biliary atresia, we have uh, one uh, questions from uh, Daria. Uh, uh, if, uh, can you rule out biliary atresia when the right and left hepatic ducts are visible but not dilated? Yeah, if you see very clearly the right and the left uh, uh, ball duct uh, joining, uh, uh, then the diagnosis is, uh, is almost full out. Thank you. And uh, from Sanjay, uh, can you use elastography for the diagnosis of biliary atresia? Do you so, use it or for follow-up? Yeah, I didn't show a lot of elastography, as I know it's it, it it's it's not available in in a lot of places. But of course, we use it. Uh, the message for elastography and biliary atresia is that uh, there is an elevation of elastography uh, in uh, babies with biliary atresia that is higher when compared with other causes of. Uh, uh, neonatal cholestasis. However, you may have a child with a biliary atresia with a normal elastography. So the, the, the finding of a normal elastography does not rule out the bad diagnosis. Thank you. Uh, regarding uh, liver steatosis, we have one question from Ekaterini from Greece. Uh, when you have liver steatosis without fibrosis, uh, is there an effect on liver shear wave elastography values? Uh, there is a, so the, the literature is quite controversial because some say that it's elevated, some say that it decreases. Uh, we, did not, we did not observe uh, modifications. So in our experience, it's uh, when there is no fibrosis, there is no impact, significant impact on uh, elastography. And do you use a grading system for uh, liver steatosis with ultrasound? It's a very um, qualitative uh, grading system. So it's uh, not very, uh, very efficient. It's, uh, it depends on the visibility of the diaphragm and uh, the, the walls of the vessels. So mild, moderate and uh, severe. Thank you. Uh, regarding biliary atresia, do you use MRI or MRCP to rule out biliary atresia or you just do? This is Tamara from Argentina. Tamara Kandel. Hi, Tamara. <laughs> no, we don't use it. It's not, it's not a, a good exam uh, because it's, um, it's, the, the spatial resolution is, is, good, is not good enough to see very tiny balducts and a normal baby or baby with some medical causes of cholestasis have very, very tiny uh, balducts. So in normal baby, you can uh, really not see them on, on MRCP. So it, it has been shown that it's not a good, uh, a good exam. Okay, uh, Ajay uh, uh, is asking about uh, uh, the criteria you use to say portal vein flow velocity is reduced. Do you have a specific number per age? Maybe it's, you can uh, 
send your email for that. Yeah, no, it's very, you, you have to be cautious with the portal vein uh, uh, velocity because it's, it's very influenced by uh, the feeding. When you, you, where, where you, you fast for a long time, there is a, a little flow in the superior mesenteric vein. That means there is very low flow in the main portal vein, even if you are a normal subject. And uh, if you lose closed, so, so, so the velocity will be uh, low even with a normal liver. And even in, in a patient who absolutely normal, when you look at uh, the subcapsular vessel, portal vessels on ultrasound uh, on the left lobe, as it is anterior with uh, the gravity, sometimes you have uh, hepatofugal portal flow in those very small veins when uh, uh, they didn't eat. And if you make them eat and you see them after, they have absolutely normal and beautiful flow in all the liver. So there is a high variability with uh, the activity of, uh, of the bowel. Uh, thank you. Uh, Clarissa uh, from uh, uh, Italy uh, is asking about uh, bladder wall thickening in, uh, 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 in a, a liver fail in a heart failure. Uh, do you see that uh, gallbladder wall thickening in general conditions like hypoalbuminemia, uh, heart failure with congenital heart diseases? Yeah, you can you can have a wall, a gallbladder wall thickening in in a very high variety of uh, of condition, uh, especially when there are septic shocks or things like that, or uh, really a cardiac distress. Yeah, it may happen. Uh, and uh, okay, uh, Justin from Philippines is asking what which features would help you distinguish between fluid containing tumors versus abscesses. Ah, so it's that, difficult. I suppose it's yeah, it's difficult. Yeah. So the context may help you. If you have no signs of sepsis, then you will be more on the tumor side. If there are uh, signs of sepsis, that's, of course, you will be more on the uh, infectious abscess side. But when, uh, for example, you have a suspicion of abscess and you want to make a drainage or to make the puncture to, to make the diagnosis, if there is no pus that, come, that comes, then we make the biopsy because we want to rule out, uh, to confirm that it is an abscess and to rule out a non-delaying uh, tumor. But sometimes it's, it's difficult. And it depends where, which part of the world you live in, of course, on yeah. the epidemiology of things. Of course, of course. Uh, uh, Rosita is asking, if you think a lesion is a hemangioma, what's your follow-up protocol? Do you... So it, it depends on, on the criteria I told you um, during the lecture, the size of the lesion and, and the speed of the, art, uh, of the hepatic artery, the dilatation of the hepatic veins uh, and the result of the cardiac ultrasound. If, if there are signs of, uh, if it's a big lesion, if there are signs of high vascularization and we don't know yet if uh, the lesion is, in, is increasing, is growing, or is uh, involuting, then um, when there are some signs uh, that could uh, make us fear that uh, it will, this will be uh, worse in the following days, I can see them every two weeks or every weeks until I'm sure that everything gets in order and then uh, I see them once a month and then... Uh, uh, later. If it's a small lesion with no signs of activity and the baby is perfect, then we will see the, the baby perhaps one month later or three months later, six months, and then at what, one year to be, to be sure that it's uh, completely over. So we adapt the protocol according to, to the activity of the hemangioma. Thank you. Uh, regarding uh, biliary atresia, uh, do you have uh, different courses of disease or imaging features uh, in uh, preterm babies compared to term babies? That's uh, Daria uh, asking. 
Hi, Daria. Uh, uh, in fact, the, 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 the trap in premature baby is that they may have cholestasis with uh, no uh, alcoholic stools because, uh, as I told you, it's a progressive disease during the per perinatal period. So sometimes the, may, the baby may have uh, colored stools uh, at birth. And, and we can see, uh, per, for example, the triangular coat sign that increases from one exam to the other uh, during uh, the, the neonatal period, especially in the, in the youngest premature baby. So you may have the appearance of some signs uh, and sometimes some signs may disappear. For example, the microcyst, those uh, millimetric uh, cysts you will find in the same area than the triangular coat sign may disappear with, uh, uh, because I, I don't know if they get a or if they get more fibrotic, and, uh, but they may disappear during the, the evolution. And you will see sometimes the appearance of signs of cirrhosis and portal hypertension. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Tilak asking about alpha fetoprotein uh, might be mildly elevated uh, in younger children up to four months despite they have a hemangioma case, but they are worried about mild elevation of alpha fetoprotein. Uh, would this be worrisome for a hepatoblastoma? Do we expect mild elevation in very young babies? Yes, so due to a matter of time, I didn't have time to tell you this, but there is a physiological uh, elevation of alpha fetoprotein in the in the uh, infants uh, until the age of six months. Uh, so you may have very elevated alpha fetoprotein in a neonate, in a premature baby. And there are charts for this. So you, you have to compare the level of the baby with the chart that is given according to the age. Uh, and when there is a doubt, then we make a new dosage two weeks later and it should, it should decrease. If it increases, then it's an abnormal secretion of alpha fetoprotein, and then you open uh, the possibility of uh, hepatoblastoma. Thank you. And we have Ling, Dr. Ling from Singapore asking, how do you differentiate a colidocal cyst from biliary obstruction? And I would add to this, do you have trouble differentiating macrocysts from a normal gallbladder in a biliary atresia? Um, alors, for the last question, macrocyst and gallbladder, usually it's not the same place and it's not the same shape. So, uh, no, I would say it's, I, 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 I never found a case, I've never met a case where it was a, a problem. And, problem. and the previous question is uh, usually we do MRCP. Because in, in uh, congenital uh, biliary dilatation, you may have some protein plugs like uh, acting like uh, lithiasis that uh, obstru make obstruction of uh, the extrahepatic bile duct. And, and MRCP uh, is really useful uh, to try to see uh, the length of uh, the common bile duct and see if uh, there is a, a maljunction, a uh, biliary pancreatic maljunction or not. So for us, it's, it's the tool we use. Uh, you can use ERCP also if uh, the baby, if, if the child is uh, uh, old enough. And if there is, again, a, a doubt on the diagnosis, you may do the cholecystography to get some bile and, and make uh, the pancreatic uh, enzyme dosage in the bile and to see if it's elevated and confirm the diagnosis. Thank you. Uh, I don't know how much time we still have. Uh, Sanjay, if we are over time, please interrupt us. Uh, oh, we have a uh, uh, a case, uh, we have uh, an anonymous attendee asking, after ca the Kazai procedure, when you want to exclude obstruction, do you use uh, uh, IV contrast with biliary extrusion, like a hepatospecific contrast, uh, or uh, only intravenous gadolinium in your MRIs? Uh, we don't use MRI to check for obstruction. Uh, it could be scintigraphy in some cases, but uh, in the youngest babies, uh, the color of the stool is usually uh, useful. And uh, otherwise, it's the biology that will show you that there is obstruction. If you see the increase of uh, the bilirubin that was normal or, or that decreased after the surgery. 
So you, we don't use the MRS, uh, MRI for this topic. Thank you. Uh, another question is, do you have a specific view where you measure the triangular cord sign? Do you use longitudinal scans or transverse scans where you see the bifurcation of the portal vein? Do you it's, standardize it, this? It's, it's, not, it's not standardized in the literature and in clinical practice uh, either. It's, uh, in fact, the, um, the landmark is uh, the beginning, the transition between the main portal vein and, and the right hepatic vein, and it's in this area. So it's a quite uh, actual oblique uh, view, and, uh, but it's, there is no standardization. Thank you. Uh, and Nurul from Malaysia would like to uh, know your views about what is the cause of the microcysts in biliary atresia. It's probably the obstruction uh, of uh, the fibrosis that uh, takes place and uh, before the, the fibrosis at the uh, above. So probably there is a uh, bite that gets in the cyst and then it closes uh, the, the door yeah. outside. I, I don't like know. Like a beading. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, like a big I, beading. Excellent. I don't know exactly. Uh, okay, we have uh, maybe a time for one or two more questions. Uh, uh, would you like to comment on uh, periportal tracking uh, on ultrasound? Uh, do you find this often? And uh, besides trauma, like in lipidema, in... Uh, in hepatitis or maybe in lymphoma sometimes? Periportal tracking? Uh, I didn't get the, the hypoechoic uh, or the hyperechoic uh, tracts around yeah. the portal branches. Yeah, like it's, a diffuse. it's, it's a really a non specific pattern. You can find it in, in so many cases. It's, uh, I find it difficult to, to, to use it as a a prognostic or diagnostic, a diagnostic uh, pattern. Okay, and uh, at which age and above you think that a patent ductus uh, venosus is of clinical significance and should be um, managed or treated? In in the paper with uh, by Loberant, it was it was uh, all, I, I guess all premature babies had their ductus venosus closed at the age of one month, so above the age of one month, it's probably pathological. But the, I didn't have time to show. But when you have a malformative ductus venosus, in most of the time, it's really larger than uh, the ductus venosus that remained patent because of portal hypertension. So you have the suspicion sometimes from the fetal period because you see that it's really very large. Excellent. I think we uh, pretty much covered everything. Uh, and Sanjay is here. I'd like to personally thank uh, Stephanie for this beautiful lecture and all, for all the extended information uh, uh, during the discussion section. Uh, Sanjay, it's, uh, it's your turn to close the session, I think. Thank you very yeah. much, uh, Maria. <laughs> yeah, and thanks to yes, both of yeah. you. A fantastic session. Uh, I uh, found Lewin's ultrasound